Um, well, let's see if I can get this thing to work. Um, lots of others like it. It's easy, or it's easy. You could, you could avoid talking about climate change and trying to relate it to what you're doing, but I think that that's like not a terribly, that's not a helpful thing to do. I think that in the, in that the most of you, if you are interested on, you're gonna become increasingly engaged with aspects of, of this related to climate change, or some of you probably took this class specifically for that reason. So I don't wanna leave you totally outside of that kind of stuff. So I wanted to close on some of the key topics of climate change as I think of it, and some of the, some of the places where aspects of climate change touch on things that we've talked about so far. Um, so I'm specifically thinking, so we talked about paleoclimate on Tuesday, and then we started to shift towards whether paleoclimate was a context for future. I wanna talk specifically about anthropogenic climate change today. We'll talk a little bit about the forcing mechanisms. We'll talk about some of the responses, some of the key metrics, and then we'll talk about detection and attribution, which is the technical framing of how do we tell if there's a human impact on the system? We know we're emitting a lot of CO2, but how do we see that effect? So um, we'll be able to get some of those pieces together. So one thing I will say, to start off is one bummer of talking about this on the last day of class is that a lot of people find this to be an extremely depressing topic, which it can be. So we'll close talking about solutions rather than talking about problems. But even if you're talking about the problems, rather than putting your head in the sand, I would argue that you should look <laughs> things straight in the eye <laughs> and take on the problem. This is a big problem. We are all part of the solution, potentially. And then uh, Jacinta has some things she wants to show you about okay. the failure project. I remember this slide so very well. Um, but okay. so <laughs> it's hard to forget. <laughs> the failure project, as many of you know, was a document of where professors, including Baylor, um, wrote instances in their career where they've experienced failure, rejection, and frustration. Um, the idea to partner with anyone affiliated with it, which would include anyone in this room, um, is welcome to come to this room on Monday from 1 to 2, and a number of professors, but not Baylor, um, will be here and talking about their experiences, and also there will be free pizza, and you will have the chance to talk to your peers, and it's hopefully a safe space, and it's not a safe space, tell me and I'll beat that person up, and um, to invite you all, I made memes, um, so take a meme and then pass it along the table, which is very long. Yeah. yeah, cool. Thanks, Jacinta. It's going to be fun. Yeah, so if you guys haven't looked at the failure document, it's fun too. You can notice that mine is both the most extensive and also a sm perhaps the smallest sampling from among the possible failures. So we'll see. <laughs> um, but yeah, that should be good. I'm going to wait for your bowl. Okay. Okay, so. Back to climate change. All right, looking at straight in the eye, what are the things that humans do that have an impact on the global radiation budget? So we do a lot of things. This is a breakdown in terms of cumulative energy in 10 to the 21st joules, <laughs> starting from 1970 at just an arbitrary starting point, just counting up. So this is well-mixed greenhouse gases. So what are examples of well-mixed greenhouse gases? CO2. Methane. Yeah, methane. That is this one. So you can see it is a positive. It is increasing the amount of energy coming into the system. It's also the biggest one on this table. Short-lived greenhouse gases, things like ozone, um, are here. So that's not as big of a signal, but there it is. Um, changes to the solar, um, to the sun, is in this slide. So that's not a human-induced piece, but it's important to have it on here because you can see that it is quite a bit smaller than the others, which is, was originally a point of contention in climate change. Not so much anymore. Changes to land use. So if we pave a forest and turn it into a parking lot, like in the 
Joni Mitchell song, whatever, um, it changes the albedo. It also changes the moisture budget. So you might have a less humid atmosphere if you remove transpiring plants and you replace them with that. So that will then have consequences for the radiation budget. So that's a detectable piece of this story. Volcanic aerosols, oh, um, and tropospheric aerosols. So volcano aerosols, so there are aer when there are volcanoes, there's a big jump in volcanic aerosols. But then the tropospheric aerosols includes all the ones that we put up as well, so soot, essentially. And aerosols are on the negative side, at least in this conception, this is from the 2013 IPCC um, estimation of these radio forcings. So the net is not as big as the well moist greenhouse gases because there's also the aerosol effect. So this is the way that the energy budget, this is the excess energy that has appeared in the system from 1970 to 2010, according to this estimate, okay? And so 800-ish from the 10 to the 21, so 8 times 10 to the 23 joules. So we'll come back to those numbers in a minute. Um, and this is a breakdown of saying, well, where might all that energy go? Well, some of it could go into storage and some of it would get re-radiated back to space because as the planet warms up, the radiation budget is gonna change in response. So this one is not so important because it's just a weird color line. But we're gonna talk more about the energy storage in a minute. All right. So one thing that people talk about a lot when they talk about climate change is they talk about whether CO2 is a pollutant. And they are normally think of it as like this guy in this very smoky car. <laughs> Just, but is carbon dioxide a pollutant? So we kind of have to decide on what a pollutant is. So normally when people are saying it is not a pollutant, they are saying, well, carbon dioxide is natural. Every time we breathe out, there's carbon dioxide. But that's kind of true of all pollutants in a sense. It's a quantity issue. So something that is pollution is something that our activities is affecting the balance of, and at sufficient concentration, it starts to have hazardous effects. That doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to not be able to breathe the air because of the excess carbon dioxide. We are a long way shy of where the air becomes toxic because of the levels of carbon dioxide. In fact, Chris Karnaskas, who's a an oceanographer at University of Colorado has just bought himself a CO2 monitor and he's like monitoring all around his house. So he put one in this kid's room and so overnight you can see it jumping up as just as the kid is breathing out in a sealed room, like with the door shut, it builds up. And so it's kind of a fascinating thing. And it ends up being three or four times the free air concentration by the end of the night. But that's still definitely way low of what becomes toxic in terms of CO2. So it's not the poisonous effect of CO2 that's important. It's the other part of the story. So in the global carbon cycle, things like cow farts and cow belches, as we have heard about, which normally, that's actually the belching that is the more greenhouse gas, but also things like plants absorbing carbon um, and humans emitting carbon, whether breathing out or by burning fossil fuels. This whole piece is the carbon budget, and in order to really figure out what's changing, you have to take a more quantity, it's, you know, you can draw these little loop-de-loops. It's all nice, and lots of people would like this to be the end of the conversation. Like, none of this is, you know, humans are not important enough, humans are too important, whatever. To be more careful, you actually have to do something like this. So this is an estimate of the carbon budget. Um, based on 1990s data, and the black arrows are the non-human perturbed numbers, and the red arrows are the human, or the red numbers are the human perturbed part of this. So where is the carbon? So there's some in the sediments at the bottom of the ocean. There's a whole lot in the intermediate and deep ocean. There's a little bit in the surface ocean. There's some in critters living in the sea. There's a, a whole lot in fossil fuels. So inside each of these boxes are the storage, the reservoirs of carbon, and then the arrows are the fluxes of carbon. 
So there would be no natural fossil fuel burning without humans, <laughs> but with humans, in the 1990s, there was 6.4, and these are gigatons of carbon, so billions of tons of carbon, um, and gigatons of carbon per year. So 6.4 gigatons of carbon per year in the 1990s was the total human output from fossil fuels. Which is a tiny amount compared to how much goes between the atmosphere and the ocean back and forth. So it's like 10 times that. And when you put six out over here, now you get 20 going that way and 22 going that way. So the funny thing is, is that the system is responding like an amplifier, the same way that we saw the very small vertical, vertical uh, Ekman stretching and squeezing drive really big current. So the Ekman transport itself was small, but the result of it was very large. The carbon cycle is a similar kind of thing in that a small tweak in one part of the system actually spins up lots of other feedbacks and lots of other parts of it, which makes it a very interesting but also hard problem to think about. And so, you know, between vegetation and soil, like so there's 2,300 gigatons stored in the soil and like dead leaves and trees. And back and forth between primary productivity and respiration, there's about 120 gigatons of carbon per year exchange. So again, 20 times this signal, but the fact that this is there starts tipping these numbers around. And then the surface ocean goes up by 18 gigatons. The intermediate deep goes up by 100. This has a consequence on the ocean health, whether or not it changes the atmosphere. And then this one, 165 extra, so from 597 plus 165, so that's what a quarter of the total is now anthropogenic. This one affects the energy budget of the Earth. This one is ocean acidification. Does that make sense? So we're going to talk more about those in a piece. So here's what the time series looks like in terms of CO2 concentration, not gigatons of carbon, but CO2 concentration. So right now, I just looked it up, we're at 417. Back here in 1960, when Keeling started measuring this, we were down at 320-ish. Let's see, that's 345. Yeah, 3, 315. And so here is the CO2 concentration in the atmosphere. It doesn't seem to wiggle much. There, there's a lot of wiggles like this. This is what a typical annual cycle looks like. What do you think that's from? More land in the northern hemisphere. So when it's springtime in the northern hemisphere, you actually absorb net carbon into the plant life. And when it's fall, all the leaves fall off and they decay and the CO2 goes back out. So these oscillations are basically vegetation cycling on and off seasonally. And because the northern hemisphere has more land, you see the peak around northern hemisphere springtime of high, and then you start going down as stuff is growing, 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 and then you start decaying and you go back. So it's switching based on that. So that's what all the little wiggles are. In the longer term trend, there are not a lot of big wiggles. Here's one. Anybody know what that is? This is a fun one. Late or early 90s. the end of the Soviet Union. <laughs> so they were burning oil like crazy, and then they had an enormous economic collapse, and it's a detectable blip in the upward trend. Anyway, <laughs> um, oh, sorry, not 417, 411.97. Um, so this is what it is in March, and this is what it is in the oceans, at least up to 2010. So. This is in micro atmospheres, so these numbers you can compare to these numbers. So this is three different estimates of what the partial pressure of CO2 in the oceans, in the surface ocean is. Um, and you can see that from mid 80s when they started measuring up to 2010, it's climbing up. It started at about 330 and it ends up at 
380. So 380 is not 411. What's the difference? Yeah, well, that's true. <laughs> that's what we think of. Why are the oceans lower, the surface oceans? And this is, I think, 0 to 700 meters. I would guess. Might be 0 to 300 meters, though. What do we know about that would make things mixing, essentially? So it takes a while. So you might be saturated and in equilibrium within the mixed layer. But actually, to get the whole upper ocean, you have to wait for things like the subtropical cells to catch up. So the oceans lag behind. So what that means is, even if we fixed this one and managed to stop the change in the atmosphere, the oceans would continue for a while longer. They will also continue warmer, because they're continuing to absorb energy and equilibrate to the en new energy budget. But there's that part. So when you have CO2, aqueous CO2, it becomes carbonate and bicarbonate, drives an acid-base reaction, and so it lowers the pH, which means to make it more acidic. And so this is the time series of from essentially the same data, but you have to do more chemistry to figure out what the pH is. But those are measurements of the pH going down. So it's dropped by, over this time frame, about 0.6. Um, it's actually dropped down by about 0.1 that by now. Yeah. I have a chemical question for you. I'm sure a lot of yeah. you would be Yeah. <laughs> but but um, in terms of baseline, so carbon monoxide is like hundreds of people born a day. Mm -hmm. Is that not something that part of the story and does that not affect the ocean for the same reason? So carbon monoxide in the presence of oxygen with some energy around becomes carbon dioxide pretty quickly, but it is toxic at lower levels than carbon dioxide. So we worry m more about it as a direct poisonous gas. Um, it has, I don't even know whether it, I don't know what its greenhouse properties are like. It has one bond that should be sort of similar. It probably is still a greenhouse gas, but it doesn't have very high concentrations because it reacts away from being carbon monoxide shortly. But while you have it, if you're in a house with a lot of it, you get very worried because relatively low concentrations are poisonous. But I'm still in the room, so it's So it's part of fossil fuel burning. Carbon monoxide comes out as well. But it normally reacts. And if you have a clean burning reaction with plenty of oxygen supply, you don't get a lot of carbon monoxide. So the balance depends on how things are burned. Well, yeah, and I would also argue that carbon dioxide is a pollutant in sufficient quantity. So that's the question is what's the, so what's, the, what is, dilution is the solution to pollution. So this is the one. <laughs> so a pollutant is any substance present in the environment in a harmful concentration, which adversely affects the environment. So what do you mean? Is it poisonous? That is one way of, deciding when a harmful concentration occurs. So CO2 is not poisonous. Carbon monoxide could be poisonous at lower levels. But it still adversely alters the environment through its effects on ocean acidification, through its effects on the energy budget of the Earth, even at levels below when it becomes poisonous. So I would still say it is a pollutant because the concentration is such that it's adversely affecting the environment. And it, sourced from us. So you could also say that there's maybe any anthropogenic substance present in the environment. You might want to clarify that it's a human cause that makes pollution. So you could say, so I think people want to be like, oh, plastics are always terrible and there are no plastics without humans. Or nuclear waste is terrible and there's no nuclear waste without humans. That's sort of a qualitative pollutant. It's something that in any quantity is pollution because it's human sourced and it has no natural sources. But a quantitative pollutant is something that we are affecting the budgets for that particular substance. And through affecting the budgets, we're starting to see adverse effects on the environment. So even though it is a naturally occurring substance, 
but we are tipping the balance of those of the carbon cycle, and therefore it's becoming a pollutant through quantity, not through its existence. Whereas something like nuclear waste or dioxin or CFCs are pollutants. There is no natural cycle for them. They are purely human sourced. So any effects they have on the environment, you would say, are, you know, potentially adverse. But that's that's a different that's a different kind of thing. So I think there should be room for both of those, right? I mean, yeah. Um, okay. So where does the CO two come from? So this is now CO two emissions in gigatons per year, gigatons of carbon per year. So the same as we saw in that little schematic. And that was talking lumping all fossil fuels together, all countries together. This is now a breakdown. So from the 60s, so one thing you can see is in the 60s, we only emitted about two gigatons of carbon a year. And now in the mid 2010s, we're pushing 10. So our emission rate has gone up by a factor of five. Not the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere, but the rate at which we are emitting is incre still increasing. Maybe it's leveling off. And in some of the recent carbon budgets, it actually looks like it may have leveled off in recent years. But that's not good enough. We'll see in a minute. It's the cumulative emissions that count. We actually need to go down. We need to have net zero emissions in order to stop climate change. Stabilizing the emissions rate is not net zero. It's still increasing every year. We're still putting more out. And so how does it break down by country? So you can see so the US and the EU are big in the 20th century. And then the USA really took off <laughs> in the late 20th century. But since about 2005, China has actually been emitting more. Um, um, and India is also climbing. But in per capita basis, the USA is still the problem. So people here are emitting more per person, even though China overall is emitting more. There are many more people in China. So there's, you still should be aware of the two differences. If everybody in the world starts living like Americans and emitting at this rate, we are in deep trouble because a lot of these numbers are very low. Like in India, you know, that's like a tenth of that. So multiply that number by a factor of 10 and you're, we have big problems. So somehow the folks in India, China, hopefully can figure out a way to do this better and we can also reduce our emissions at the same time and we end up not having just a multiplier of all the people in the world times this per capita rate because that would be a big problem. So what are the big sources? So coal is a really big one. Oil is a really big one. Gas <laughs> is a big one. And cement is actually a pretty big one. So primarily fossil fuels, but also the production of cement releases a lot of greenhouse gases. And all of these are trending upward except for coal is maybe going down a little. And it's actually it's not the huge shadow. Yeah. 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 It's, it's, so that flip is from China. Yeah, it's still going. It's, it's, it's still going up overall. Yeah. Actually, um, and now, what is it? Yeah. It's not. It's not so great. Or a different way to think of it is, where did it all go? <laughs> and so this is a different way of making that global carbon budget, but as a function of time. So here is the emissions of fossil fuels, and here is the emissions from land use change. And these are all cumulative. And so whatever that is needed to go somewhere. And so this is how much was measured to go into the ocean. This is how much is ending up in changing the CO2 level in the atmosphere. And then there, this is actually not a measurement of the land. It's just what's left over after you take these two. And they know it had to go somewhere, so it went into the land. That was the way that that's calculated. So um, it's about a third, a third, a third in the modern era. Um, it's not clear that these three have the same capability of absorbing going forward. 
the ocean, as it gets warmer, is less able to take up stuff. And the land, conceivably, could just decide that it's not doing anymore because it's, you know, whatever. Deforestation is fighting against it. So deforestation is a big part of the yellow side of that. Yeah? Oh, probably, yeah. <laughs> Late 70s, that's probably oil price fluctuation. I think the time is just not as good as like the time of year. Like on the back of our skulls, we have like these like dots of like oil on the side of them. So I'm sure you're totally still over here. <laughs> you can tell a lot of interesting stories with these wiggles. <laughs> I don't know whether they are all actually predictable. I mean, well, we'll get to the denier and skeptic conversation in a little bit. One of the big things that people like to do with these kind of figures is just like show you that. <laughs> like they would say, look, oil drops. And then they just show you a, a particular range. And they don't ever zoom out. So if there is ever a longer time series available, you should always use it, even if their uncertainties are pretty big on the ends. So that's part of the processes to try and push these out as far as you can go. And last, like when we saw with sea level, the satellite era is systematically different from the tide gauge. So you might show the longest satellite era you can, and then the longest tide gauge you can, and then the longest salt marshes you can in separate figures, but putting them side by side. Um, and so this is from so Corinne LeClaire, who actually, did any of you see her when she was here? She visited here. Um, for like a semester, I, whatever. Anyway, um, she and colleagues put out this global carbon inventory every year now. Um, and so this is one, this is the 2016 one. There's actually an updated one. And so one of the things they do is they try and figure out which country is doing what and put them together. So you can see, so the United States has changed trajectory partly, largely, because we switched from coal to natural gas, not because we our politics got all that much cleaner. Natural gas got cheaper when we started fracking. And so that switch in gigatons of CO2 per year actually shows up that way. It, there are special ways to count methane that's complicated. So that doesn't necessarily mean that the emissions went down should be very careful which metric people are talking about under that, or that the energy consequences, the energy budget consequences are not. Methane is a, a more potent greenhouse gas, but a short-lived one. So it reacts into other things that it's been in the atmosphere, but while it is methane, it is much more effective at trapping energy than per unit carbon than CO2 is. Okay, so the European is, Union is going down, Russia is going down. Japan is going down, India is going up, China is going up. Um, and all of these countries down here are going up, but they're relatively small. They're going up large relative amounts, but relatively small total amounts because they're, they weren't emitting that much in the be beginning. Or you can put it this way, and you can, you can do this kind of, where do they all come from? And so this is, CO2 emitted from 1850 to present. So this is the cumulative numbers. Um, no, that's not right. Sorry, this is still annual emissions. This is billions of metric tons of CO2 um, emitted. So you can see that the relative amounts are changing. So China is developing and is becoming a much bigger slice, um, whereas the United States is very slightly <laughs> decreasing European Union is slightly decreasing on top. So in a nutshell, the Earth's cable is absorbing some excess carbon. Um, but if we have a high rate of emission, that will challenge the ability of the oceans and the land to take it up until a lot of it will stay in the atmosphere. Um, and essentially what we're doing is we're taking millions or billions of years of fossil fuels and burning them all at once, and so really tipping it. So just like, so global warming isn't just a carbon problem, 
carbon toxicity isn't the problem, except for in the case of ocean acidification, but it's that carbon dioxide affects life on Earth through these other means. So in some sense, is energy a pollutant? Energy is also naturally occurring, but it is the excess energy that is changing the surface temperatures, and it's the excess energy is coming from the atmospheric carbon dioxide changing the energy balance of the planet. So we talked about this like early, early in the class, the idea that sun's energy comes in and reflects out. And then if you put carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, you pre prevent the energy from going back out to space, which means that more of it gets trapped in this surface layer of the Earth. And the surface layer of the Earth has an is the atmosphere, but also the mixed layer of the ocean. So which one of these has higher heat capacity? The ocean, right? So like about three meters of the ocean is the equivalent in heat capacity as the whole atmosphere. And the mixed layer is how deep? Yeah, so like hundreds of meters, 100 meters to many hundreds of meters in the wintertime hemisphere. Um, so this is where most of the energy ends up. It ends up changing the mixed layer temperatures, so the upper ocean temperatures. So in some sense, the budget for energy that we're thinking about is the sun coming in, reflected part going back out, out going long wave, radiation back to space, and when it is left over, the temperature we care most about is not the temperature of the atmosphere, it's the temperature of the mixed layer of the ocean. That's where the energy is. So this is putting it a different way, so this is showing us some measurements. So this is the, the planetary energy imbalance from 93 to 2008 using ship based measurements and using Argo 2005 to 2010. And basically the big blue thing is how much energy of the anomaly is ending up in the ocean. So essentially all of it is in the ocean. Um, there's a little bit in the atmosphere, that's this little red bar, a little bit warming up the land, that's the yellow bar, and a little bit melting ice, which is the green bar. Um, and these are just time series of that same thing, showing uh, zero to 300 meter ocean, so this is really mixed layer ocean, and then 300 to 700 meter ocean, that's kind of above the thermocline, then thermocline, pictocline waters, and so breaking it down like that, and then this is 93% of the imbalance at the top of the atmosphere. So 93% of what's observed at the top of the atmosphere is going into the ocean. So that's another way to put it. Even with little funny wiggles, some of them are getting reflected in the ocean warming. And which basin is it going into is what these are. So this is 0 to 2,000, 0 to 700 meter, and 700 to 2,000. And you can see that the fat ones are the Indian Ocean, the tropical and subtropical Atlantic, and the tropical and subtropical Pacific. The North Pacific is tiny. The Southern Oceans are pretty big. The North Atlantic is pretty small. So from our oceanographic perspective, why are the subtropics warming up more? subtropics we have an Ekman convergence or divergence? Convergence. So the surface water that is getting heated up is converging and going where? Down. Into the subtropical cells. So the subtropical cells are warming up fast because there's a surface convergence. Whereas in the North Atlantic and North Pacific, what do we have for Ekman? divergence, which means that we just keep bringing up cold water from below. So maybe the surface is warming up, but it's not storing that heat subsurface. It's just sliding away on the surface layer. So the surface layer warms up, but nothing below the surface layer, whereas in the subtropics, the surface layer warms up and then gets subducted. 
then a new surface layer warms up and gets subducted, then a new surface layer gets subducted. And what about the Southern Ocean? We have the transport up, coming up of North Atlantic deep water, and then what does it do? Splits two different ways. <laughs> yeah, so it so the Mariana so it goes up and then one branch comes back along the surface and then goes down and the other branch goes this way and makes Antarctic bottom water. So both the Antarctic bottom water and the um, Antarctic intermediate water are warming up. So that's this guy. So, and just as a reminder, here are the subtropical cells. So we have upwelling here and then Ekman pumping all through here. So you're warming this surface layer and then it's just getting shoved down along the isopycnals, warming up the upper ocean, even below the next layer, the upper ocean. Whereas over here you have upwelling, so the mixed layer might be warming up to the atmosphere, but you're refreshing it. And then down here, you're both going this way and going that way. So you're, you're storing the warm surface waters into other places. So if we want to do all these budgets all at once, we can do it in a climate model. Budgets of everything, budgets of atmosphere, budgets of ocean, budgets of carbon, budgets of energy. That's how a climate model works. And now we have a good sense of that, at least from the ocean perspective through ECHO. And then well, I don't know. I don't even want to read these necessarily. There's a whole lot of statements like this. So warming in the climate system is unequivocal. Ocean warming dominates the increase in energy storage. Over the last two decades, the ice sheets have been losing mass. We're getting there. These are the pieces of, these are stating the observational evidence. But what's not so clear from this from any of these is why. So these are saying we go out and observe the world and we see change. We see that things are warming. So the next piece I want to talk about is how we decide that that warming is due to what we are doing. So we have, we know the carbon is rising and that's a direct impact of carbon and actually you can go through the carbon budget and say here's the amount of fossil fuels, here's the atmospheric rise, Here's the ocean acidification piece. Like Those are the pieces we were talking about. But what about the energy budget? How do we know that those temperatures are actually due to the perturbations to the energy system that are coming from the CO2 and not from something else? Does that make sense to everybody? So we have climate models. So how do we use climate models like that? Wow. All right. <laughs> so we imagine a planet B. <laughs> we imagine a planet without us and simulate both of them. And then we try and see the separation between the temperatures in those two settings. So here's uh, one example. So this is what you get. So the black line here are observations of the temperature anomaly of the global mean surface temperature. So this is an atmosphere low level temperature anomaly. And so from zero over some, it's probably zero over average from 1900 to 1950. And then it's climbing up, reaching three quarters of a degree, at least in this particular baseline. Um, each of the blue lines is a climate model. They're all different climate models. So there's a spaghetti plot of lots of different climate models. You can see things like volcanoes, that all of the climate models are responding together and dipping down together. But overall, the whole trend is going up. And not only that, the whole trend is going up together with the observation. It used to be a strict rule in climate modeling centers that this figure was not used to tune the model. That this was, you were not allowed to check what your answer was on this figure to then change the parameter in the model. You were supposed to just, whatever came out on this figure was what came out and then you'd compare to observations. In the recent generation, 
NCAR broke that trend because they made this figure and they're kind of mild cool over the 20th century. And they weren't sure why. <laughs> they didn't go back and tune precisely to this, but they did reject that kind of model as having something wrong with it and decided to recalibrate the way they did the clouds. They had done a whole new cloud system and the cloud system they had was very sensitive to aerosols. They thought it was, they couldn't immediately rule out whether it was unrealistically sensitive to aerosols until they made this figure. Then they got worried. Then they went back to the aerosol bunch and recalibrated the way the clouds were oriented. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay, so what do you think happens if we take away the human influences, the human greenhouse gases, but leave in the natural forcing, solar variations and um, volcanoes? More flat? Yeah, so it looks like that. So the fact that the observations are outside of the cluster indicates that they are not consistent with one another. So you can go back. There are times when the observations are out on the edge, <laughs> but not totally outside the cluster and not persistently outside the cluster in this case. So these wiggles are you know, the El Ninos and NAOs and climate variability and an exceptionally cold winter or whatever is what's making this wiggle. And each of those models also has those kind of phenomena. They're not necessarily in sync with each other, which is why you get a kind of spaghetti plot. But the range over all the models seems to include the observations. It's the key piece here. Whereas without human forcing, it doesn't. So this is the way that we would say you, we can detect after about 1980, you can detect that the global mean surface temperature change is inconsistent with our construction of the Earth's warming without the human influence. Yeah? How do they separate out the inputs from the climate model? So you put it in, essentially. So the climate model would have CO2 specified as a function of time, and aerosols specified as a function of time, and land use changes specified as a function of time. So all of those are forcings that are inside the climate model. So they just don't do those things. So instead of changing the land use as cities grow, they just keep the land model doing whatever it was doing. Instead of increasing the aerosols, they just leave the aerosols at a pre-industrial level. Instead of increasing the CO2, they leave the CO2 at a pre-industrial level. And they see what the model does. And the model has El Ninos, and it still has volcanoes, and it's still dropping around, but it's not it doesn't match the observations if you do that. And in fact, you can do better than this. You can do this continent by continent and ocean basin by ocean basin and do this same game where you're trying to look for signals. On every continent, in terms of the land temperatures, you can see the difference between the observations going in the cluster of anthropogenic or anthropogenically forced warming scenarios. So the pink are the, all the including anthropogenic effects, and the blue are not included, the gray, whatever color that is. Um, and so you can see that those two have separated sometime between maybe the 70s or 80s on all of the continents, except for Antarctica. Um, and so the average over all the land surfaces they are clearly separate sometime around 1980 where they're not overlapping anymore. So we can detect the, climate, the anthropogenic global warming signal. And we can attribute this warming to that, those sources of anthropogenic forcing. If you take that land and ocean surface together, you get a slightly different figure. If you take the ocean heat content, they're not so separate. They are still a little bit separate, but they're not as far separate as this. And part of that is just because the ocean is slow to warm up. Like, the ocean wobbles around, and this is still, this warming is catching up with this earlier warming because it still has to cycle through all the subtropical cells and separate itself out for the climate. And if you go to any of the ocean basins, you can see that while there are separations in the ocean heat content, 
it's not, they're not nearly as cleanly separated as like North America is, where they're two separate bunches. Yeah. Can you explain why what the ocean heat content is? So, ocean heat content is um, you take the potential temperature and you multiply by the surface heat capacity. And so, it's effectively, it is the ocean temperature, but it's the relevant ocean temperature for the thing that could release energy to the atmosphere or gain energy from the atmosphere. So ocean heat content is like the quantity in the heat budget of the ocean that gives, that gives you, um, that quantifies how much energy has been taken up by the ocean. So it's like rho Cp times T is the ocean heat content. So or the anomaly is delta T. And this is potential temperature you like. And so that means that if it's, you know, the 2,000 meter water that warmed up, you know that the temperature it's at is actually not the temperature it would have if you brought it to the surface. It might have expanded because it would cool off in the expansion. And so you have to be a little bit careful about which level the warming is happening. And so using potential temperature there makes it, takes care of that effect. Because the, the exchanges with the atmosphere would all happen at the surface. So you're using a surface relevant value of the specific heat and the potential temperature reference to the surface, and then everything goes that way. But you could also say, well, I could just think of delta potential temperature over that same layer, and that's proportional to this. So it's not that different. It's just um, whatever. There, those are the units that people have decided are the right way to think about. <laughs> One cool thing about this is that climate models actually can do this. And so that's an amazing thing. Like all of the oceanography we've talked about, when I was a grad student, we could do ocean modeling, but we did not believe that they were this good. It had just gotten to where they were, could run for freely without flux corrections, and they didn't really look like observations yet. They were too coarse and they were kind of crummy. Now, it is very difficult to tell when you get a high quality ocean model whether it is an ocean model or an ocean observation frequently in lots of variables. So they are getting better and better and better and therefore this kind of conclusion about this kind of story is getting more and more certain as the models are getting better and better. So that part of the logic is getting clearer. And then I have some cool pictures. Have I shown you guys this one yet? This is a really cool one. This is the cube sphere. So logically, in a lot of models, they use a cube sphere. So it's that's the arrangement of the grid cells. So echo is similar to this, except it's got 13 faces rather than six. But then the real <laughs> geometry of the Earth is like that. <laughs> so anyway, whatever. Cool images. Whatever. Um, all right. And so in that stage of examining what we can learn from the climate models and whether planet A versus planet B, we need to pay a lot of attention to the things like the multi-model bias in the temperature. So here's the temperature. Here's the absolute error. Here is the reanalysis inconsistency. So this is places where the weather models drift away from the observations persistently. So each of these pieces is, you, it's possible that that whole result was because we were doing the wrong thing in response to CO2 or the wrong thing in response, it didn't simulate the weather right, so why should we trust it? So building and examining different aspects of model error, same way we have been all along with ECHO, is like a huge part of that process. So that's a big part of where climate science is, is just like, We've got these models, we can run them, we can ask that planet A versus planet B question, but we, why do we trust them in the first place? You have to do a lot, a lot, a lot of model data comparison on as many independent data streams as you can that weren't part of the modeling system tuning in the beginning. And then, so we talked about the simplest case, which is all anthropogenic forcings or no anthropogenic forcings, but actually if you really want to understand the details of how the system works, you might 
do other things like a 1% per year increase of CO2, which is roughly what we're doing, but not exactly, but this is a, an easier thing to compare. And maybe we are wrong about the past history of CO2, but this we could compare multiple models. They all have 1% CO2. That's an equal basis. And if the models disagree there, then they probably disagree in some fundamental way. We could do a historical run. We could do a future scenario with either lots of mitigation of our emissions or none at all. We could do the mid-Holocene in the last glacial maximum. <laughs> we could do um, runs that go out to 2300. And so this kind of framing um, is what it, you have to do if you want to become one of the modeling centers that gets included in the coupled model intercomparison program, which is CMIP, which is the system that then gets included into the IPCC. So everybody, every modeling center that participates in the IPCC has to do the pink one. You get to choose if you want to do the yellow one, but a lot of them do them. And then only the places that have a huge amount of computer time do the green ring. And they typically do it when they have like a paleoclimate modeling um, group in their institution who knows what to do with last millennium simulations or individual forcing simulations or the detection and attribution ensemble. So this outer piece is really subject to whether you have the expertise in-house to do it. And so maybe six or seven modeling centers might do each of these outer rings, and probably none of them do all of them, but some of them do bits and pieces. A dozen might do these kind of intermediate pieces, and then all of them, so four dozen or so, would do this, this central piece. And so you get a sense as to dip how much the models agree and disagree from these central runs, and then specific scientific questions get asked in these outer rings. Sense to everybody, and as you can imagine, these are decided by committee, by some horrible process where people get together and then argue like for hours and hours and hours about whether this one should be in here or out there, this one should be out there or in here. You know, so here are four different forcing, future forcing scenarios, and two of them are in the outer ring, and one or two of them are in the inner ring. Who decided which one goes in the outer and which one goes in the inner? That's a big fight. <laughs> Okay, so you may have thought of this. <laughs> I asked this question and I was like, how, the, I remember like sitting there and thinking, how is that possible? We can't predict, we can't predict the weather at all. So it's, this is really the key distinction, as Akash knows well, between weather and climate. There's some, there is a prediction from a particular set of initial conditions to a particular future event. So a blob of warm water, how long does it persist so that it can be forecasted in its evolution? That's not what a climate model does, but that is what a weather model does. A weather model says, there's a storm at this location in this observation. I'm going to evolve that particular storm forward. A climate model says, this time of year, we have a statistical likelihood of storms all around the world, and so there is a storm in any particular one of these models, but that's not what it's forecasting. It's not forecasting the individual events. It's forecasting the statistics of those events. So different models in the spaghetti will have different El Ninos. They'll have different weather systems. They'll have different hurricanes. They'll have different cold snaps, they'll have different droughts, they'll have different et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Those high frequency variability pieces will differ among each of them because they all had different initial conditions way back at the beginning and the climate system is chaotic. So after about two weeks, the initial conditions in the atmosphere anyway have been erased. But the envelope of variability is still predictable from the climate system itself. The envelope is controlled by how much energy there is available to the system. The amount of atmospheric temperature versus ocean temperature is variable, but it's bounded. You can't make the ocean warmer than the atmosphere through an air-sea exchange of heat. You can't make the atmosphere warmer than the ocean through an air-sea exchange of heat. 
So there's an overall limit on those kinds of energy anomalies blobbing around from one part of the system to another. So what a climate model is really good at is just keeping track of that overall consistency, not individual events. Does that make sense to everybody? But even when you're talking about weather, weather models are also getting better. <laughs> so this is, this is a demonstration of weather models getting better. So the green one is a reanalysis product. So that's like after the event, we take a weather model and we try to make the weather model match the observations. So the green line is how well you can do with that. And that's perfect observations, perfect knowledge of the past. This is just how bad the model is in matching what happened. That's what the green line is showing. This is northern hemisphere up here, and this is southern hemisphere. No, sorry. Southern hemisphere over there, and the green lines are 144 hour eras, errors. So this is 144 hours after you've stopped paying attention to observations. How far away are you? Um, the blue lines are forecasts. So this is the one day forecast, and this is the year that that forecast was performed, not the simulated year. <laughs> So back in the 80s, the error in a one-day forecast was close to triple the error that you could get in the best possible model hindcast of what you were what you were doing. So basically the forecast was zinging off and going erroneous after only a day. The 144-hour, so six-day forecast, is also, was also something like double that error. But as you can see, as we go into the future, these forecasts are getting much, much better. So good that, in fact, they are now indistinguishable from the perfect model at the one day, and they're cro they have also crossed over here. So this RMS error is only, is rapidly approaching that one. So the six-day forecast in no, they're different. They're not. But this one's 20, and this one's 40. So the six-day forecast at 2012 was only twice as bad as the one-day forecast was in 1980. So we're looking six times farther into the future and getting almost as accurate of an answer. Yeah. So how is so I believe it is between the way that the interim uh, they're actually relative to each other so I believe the blue line after this date is not the error versus observations it's the error versus the green line so the green line is always there underneath the blue is the distance of the forecast model from the green. So green would be perfect in this set, in this comparison. So you're going below, which means you're closer to the reanalysis than the reanalysis is to the observations. Which isn't the same as being closer to the observations. Does that make sense? Okay. And so we watched this movie early on too. Remember, this is the winds and the pulsing of energy going back and forth between the ocean, and then the relatively slow evolution of the mixed layer depth and the ocean temperature. But if we speed up the movie, this is, well, except for the fact that it died. This is what a climate model sees is basically the winds are just like bing, 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 like totally random. But the ocean is now evolving like a turbulent fluid. Can I get it to go back again? No, I can't. Anyway, so um, so the so this part is like the climate model has to do with the turbulent ocean, whereas the weather model has to do with the turbulent atmosphere. Where if we are predicting the turbulent ocean, we might not even care what the atmosphere is doing storm by storm. We just want the statistics of the exchanges. So in some sense, the slower time scales of the ocean are a big part of the interannual decadal predictions that could be made 
And then the overall budget of atmosphere ocean exchanges on average is what like the centennial climate model is predicting, which is just the overall budget of energy anywhere in the system, not regarding which fluid is holding it. All right. All right. So this is one of the more unnerving graphs. <laughs> Let me take a minute to explain what it is. So this is the cumulative anthropogenic CO2 emissions after 1870. So this is kind of like what a lot of those graphs that we were looking at before were showing. And this is the temperature anomaly to which models go after this amount of emissions have occurred. So the fact that this is a straight line and these are different scenarios of emitting at different rates. So here are the observations up to there. And then here is a relatively slow frequency of emissions. This is one that is a really slow frequency of emissions and it never actually gets to very high total event. And this red one is business as usual. So whether we get to this level of emissions by 2050 or 2100 or it doesn't matter so much as to what temperature we hit when we get there. Does that make sense? So every bit of carbon that we emit and have emitted is moving us in that direction. And we will eventually level out somewhere after we go not to net uniform emissions per year, but net zero. No more emissions means we don't move this way anymore. And then we will be stuck with whatever temperature we're stuck with at that level. So unless we start removing carbon from the atmosphere and go backwards this way, that's where we are. So this is why getting to a leveling off the rate of emissions increase is not enough. Having a uniform rate of emissions just means that we move uniformly in time in this direction. But it does not mean that we stop warming. We stop warming when we st stop emitting altogether. Does that make sense to everybody? And this is not what you would think if you were thinking about the energy budget necessarily. This is a bit of a circuitous thing because what you think of oh put the CO2 up then that changes the rate of warming now because CO2 is trapping in more energy so the D temperature D time is going up to respond to that energy this is more about the equilibration after a while so this is you rebalance the energy at what temperature with what cloud effects with what ocean temperature that's what this is talking about so it's talking about the system finding a new equilibrium it's, there seems to be a pretty close linearity between the cumulative emissions and the equilibration temperature. And so once you have that concept in mind, then you can go and say, well, how much temperature are we in for <laughs> over in the future? Well, we, what if we emit, you know, this is the amount of variability we might have, and then we could have a spread among all the models, which is kind of the thick red line in that last figure. And then this green part is the scenario spread. So one way to read this is the biggest influence on what temperature we're going to get to at 2100 is what we choose to do. Not the internal variability of the system due to weather, not the uncertainty due to the models disagreeing with each other, but it's the green one, which is what we choose to do between very, very rapid emissions reduction and just letting it go, burning at the same rate that we have been all along. Does that make sense to everybody? So the biggest uncertainty is what will humans choose, at least in this figure. Um, and then you can go into all the other projections and think about other things like sea level rise, surface temperature change, September sea ice extent, surface pH, or projections of ocean heat content. And each of these would have ranges based on what humans decide to do and what the model spread is and what the internal variability is, depending on each metric. 
So the internal variability in pH is very low. <laughs> These are really precise, but the spread between what humans decide to do is actually pretty big. And coral psi, somewhere in there, so you don't, so these are not trivial changes in terms of the amount of pH. Or you could look at other variables, precipitation, not just temperature, or surface pH, or this is the, mo the most unnerving one on this figure, September sea ice extent in the Arctic. So in September is when the Arctic's at its minimum. So this is about what it's doing now, or this is 2010, I think, no, uh, 66 to 2005. This is what it's predicted to be at 2100, or 2180 to, 2080 to 2100. So it's just nuts. So ice-free Arctic in the summertime. And that has all of the consequences of now that water is exposed to the sun, and so it's warming up faster, which is part of this signal, which is why the poles are warming much faster than the rest of the Earth. It's because of feedbacks through things like sea ice. for the, the sea, ice. sea ice to temperature, it is sort of there. There are a bunch of effects. It's not the one that you think. It is not the case that it's the albedo of the sea ice reflecting sun. That's actually not that, that's not as important as you might think because it, in, there's not a whole lot of sun <laughs> up there anyway, but the air-sea exchanges of energy and the other effects of sea ice on affecting the, the polar climate do have a big, a big effect. Plus, what's not here is the feedbacks of the sea ice on the ice shelves and ice sheets and glacier flow, which is another part of this story. That part is not very well resolved. So the ice, sea ice albedo effect is normally overstated and kind of a simplistic approach, but there are many consequences of sea ice which do have an, a big impact on polar amplification. Some of them are on the air sea fluxes, some of them are on changing the atmospheric circulation through what its bottom boundary condition is, and all of them are part of this polar amplification. Okay, last thing we wanna talk about, disinformation. <laughs> so what do you need to know as a scientist? How do you contemplate the fact that people are going to lie just lie about what this stuff is, ha is happening. And they will try deliberately to make, to make you argue on their terms rather than on the terms of agreed upon facts or observed facts. So this is a big part of the situation when you have conversations outside of science. And it's a very confusing part of the situation because in this classroom or when you're at an AGU meeting, you don't see any of this stuff. So you're not really ready to have those arguments with somebody who's tr deliberately trying to distort what's going on. So if you do have conversations with family members or whatever, other people outside of the scientific community, this is part of what you want to think about. So the first thing um, to keep in mind is that among the general public, the people who believe that human activity is a significant contributing factor in changing the mean global surface temperature is only about 50 something percent as of this 2009 study. But among people who are climate scientists who are actively publishing in climate change, it's 97%. So the closer you are to the information, the stronger your confidence is that there is a human impact on this part of it. And there is very little disagreement among the not climatologists or even people who are scientists who are pu not publishing in climate sciences, but the, cl the closer you get to climate sciences, the higher that piece goes. Does that make sense to everybody? Um, this is a lovely book that you might have seen. I have a copy of this that I keep floating around. Um, this is not the IPCC. This is the N. IPCC, and this is not an 800 author list of people. There are three authors and one forward. <laughs> and, but the font they choose, even this little gold seal is meant to mimic 
what an IPCC report looks like. So this is put out by the Heartland Institute. So look, here's the IPCC book. There's that book. They've got some like trees. <laughs> They've got some like natural things. They've got this same sans serif font like that. They've got the big title and then they've got the little title. They've got the big title and they've got the little title. They're in white. They've got a little box down here. They've got a little crest. They've got a little box down here. There's this guy. Anyway, um, so the Heartland Institute put this out and they, and we read on the back cover, it says that over 600,000 copies or something have been printed, which is a strange thing to do because they printed them and they just gave them away. They did not sell them. They, their intention is to give one of these books to every school teacher in the world. This is a thin little book and it has like in-class activities that you can discuss why climate change is not well understood. And they are extremely distorted. There are websites you can go to now that point by point tell you why that book is crazy. But you have to be very careful about sourcing of this kind of stuff. <laughs> So the Heartland Institute is what it is. What are they? They are a, um, a, a, a nonprofit. They're a lobbying group, essentially. They are, a, a rep they are almost wholly funded by the fossil fuel industry or by individuals who are related to the fossil fuel industry through donations. Not the IPCC. No, <laughs> they have something. I, I can't remember what NIPCC stands for. Do I have it in the next slide? I don't have it. Oh well, sorry. <laughs> we can look it up. But um, if you are trying to find out some stuff and you're trying to make organized class notes or organize your own thoughts about things, there are lots of very good resources online, that's part of what we've done in this class is to find like where do you go? Like you go to NASA when you're looking for satellite data. You don't go to some other weird website that's like put out by the Heartland Institute that has only a tiny fraction of the time series. But I mean part of this is normal science, like go to peer reviewed journals, that's where these things get hashed out and it's very hard to publish in peer reviewed journals with crummy data or with misleading conclusions. It's not impossible, but it is harder. Go to the scientific societies they tend to put at least the headline pieces of the story, they will put them in a form that is ready for you to extract from. They will give you slides, they will give you discussion points, they'll give you in-class exercises to give to your students. That's part of what all of them, even the National Academy and the AAAS, which are across all sciences, not across just climate sciences, still think of this as part of what the educational mission should be. And then of course, the government and public funded research agencies have an agenda to have the most accurate information they can do. So they are not politically directed, they are in the business of producing information that politics can be based upon. So they try very hard to eliminate that. So when you look at the IPCC, which is a UN body or NOAA or NASA, in theory they are trying to, at least in the data sets they're releasing, come away without a political tilt on what they're doing. They're trying to get at revealing the underlying data with as little spin on it as they can. Um, and then these three websites are really good ones for um, looking at. So the real climate is Gavin Schmidt was like the person from NASA Gifts is we can't, he was kind of like a coder um, and was working on ocean modeling there. And he started blogging very hard about, and their intent was whenever there's a contentious issue that comes up in the media, they wanted to give a scientist's perspective on whether or not that's accurate. And so over time, it's a great resource. It has pretty much every hotly debated climate and weather related issue is discussed on there somewhere. It's not as active as it used to be. Skeptical science was a point-by-point -point refutation of uh, climate denier arguments. So every time a, there was a new argument that was brought up by a climate denialist, they would say, well, hey, that's it. if you didn't look at the whole data set, here's what it looks like if you zoom out, or 
that's because that instrument has now been shown to have this particular bias, and here's the description of that, and here's the scientific paper that explains it, and done in a way that you can point non-scientists, it's written at a level that is, a pre that is understandable at that level. And D smog blog is, has some of overlap with skeptical science, but it also, they, this is really helpful if you are ever in charge of running a seminar series, they do a bio of every climate denier and climate skeptic out there. And they talk about who funds them, they talk about what their typical arguments are, and they put it out so that you can think about what you were doing if you're about, if you're supposed to have a debate with somebody, you can go there and see what their situation is. So, valuable resources. Um, and then a, a closing thought. Does it matter whether we have a consensus as to what, what happens from a scientific perspective? Does it make it right that it's consensus? And maybe the most interesting scientific counter argument to all of this is that when we think about scientific revolutions, we don't think about people who are in the consensus. We think about a lot of people who are outside of the consensus and still came to the right answer. And so you don't want necessarily to think that a consensus opinion is the truth, but as we're figuring out the value of people's contributions and which the truth piece is, we can as a group think about the value of, different, of the different contributions that are coming out each time. So hopefully as you go along in your science, you can put those pieces together Think about that. Think about how do you take a new idea which maybe goes against what you have seen before and put it into a context of a bigger set of ideas. Think about the impacts. Think about whether it makes sense. And retain both optimism that we could, things could be easier than we fear them to be, but they also could be much harder or much scarier than we fear them to be. And so when we talk to people about how to make decisions in the face of that uncertainty. That's a big part of the whole story of how we think about climate. Okay. So that was the optimistic endpoint, sort of. <laughs> Maybe it's better than we thought it was. Okay, cool. Are there any questions before we adjourn for ever? <laughs> <laughs> A little bit. Um, so you can imagine if you take away the ice, now winds and waves are going to have a different effect. The mixed layer is going to deepen. One of the big feedbacks is, is that presently there is a fresh layer sitting on top of a warmer, saltier layer. So one of the first things that happens when you take the ice away is now the fresh layer actually gets mixed up and the warmth below gets released. How well we know that? depends on the ice-free Arctic behaving like other places in, on Earth. The mixing physics of that is sort of straightforward. The circulation response, the Arctic isn't like any other ocean. It's sitting right on the pole. Its wind pattern is funny. It's not going to have a, a gyre of the same flavor as the other gyres because of that. So models certainly make predictions. But actually, this case is models disagree more about this case than they disagree about this case. <laughs> so, this one may be the harder one to model because we don't understand the ice ocean interface as well as we understand the ice free ocean. But you should, we'll see how well they work. I mean, the mixed layer depth, I think that part of it is probably pretty solid. Those pieces are, 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 are pretty good, but now how the consequences of the momentum and the way that it gets balanced and whether we need to resolve all the eddies there to have it be a meaningful balance like the ACC where we have to essentially do that or whether our guesses as to how eddies work sort of are okay there, those pieces are still subject to seeing how things change.
and we'll be able to go observe it soon enough <laughs> and see what's happening. I mean, Arctic observations in general have been hard because it's hard to get up there. It's hard, you know, whatever. So <laughs> they're not all, they're not so many, and they're very few underneath the ice. And so those changes are coming now. There are submarines, and there are profilers that get drilled through the ice, and then they profile and measure ocean temperature and salinity below as the ice pack drifts around and stuff. So we're getting more information, but we don't have a many decades perspective on what's going on. And we don't have all of the variables you'd want measured at all of the locations that you'd want. Um, the same way as we don't in other places, but it's probably worse in the Arctic and the Southern Ocean because of how hard it is to get there. Cool. We will be in in touch.